Dr. Gold. Today we're going to talk about the latest drill results from the 2021 first drill program and the exploration outlook for this year. My name is Adina and I'm the director of Emerging Markets Capital that is hosting this event. So ESG is a private money investment firm based in Hong Kong and we're also an early investor in just a quick reminder that this webinar is for informational purposes only. Well, I'm sure many of you here are tech new companies, but in case you're not, that's a gold based um, gold exploration company listed on CSXP on the DLDT ticker. And it is focusing on advancing the Satya Gold project located in Northern Richmond, Canada. And last week, the company put out a press release with the latest drill results in the 2021 drill survey. And today, we will have an opportunity to learn more uh, from our speakers, who I will introduce now. So, Michael Rock is the president and CEO of Satya. He has over 15 years of international experience in capital markets, venture capital, and corporate advisory. And some of the names mentioned here include Millennium BCP, Barclays Capital, uh, where Michael was responsible for derivatives and strategies products uh, with a focus on commodities. So, Marco is also a CFA capital holder, holding an MBA degree from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and the London Business School. And also, with me, we have David Mead, who is a technical advisor of Satya. David is a consultant geologist with over 25 years of experience in the mining industry. And he conducted direct field based uh, geological studies on the project, with, which collectively contain over 600 million ounces of gold and over 2 billion of ounces of silver, including the project in the current shine and the ABCD greenstone belt. So, uh, gentlemen, we will deliver the presentation first, and you are more than welcome to ask any questions you might have during the presentation, and we will make sure to have them answer in the Q&A session afterwards. So, please just type them in the Q&A box so you can drop me an email as well. So, with this, I'm handing it over to Marco, and enjoy the presentation. Uh, thank you, Dina. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you also, David Rees, our Chief Technical Advisor, for, for being here. Uh, no one really better than Dave to, to really articulate you know, what we've achieved so far and really the potential of, of what we have here, which I, I believe to be really tremendous. And I think the investment community is really starting to really understand the potential of what we have here. I would just uh, like to bring your attention to the four looking statements, which we will be making today. Quick introduction before I hand uh, over to, to David Rees. So Cassia Gold, we are a Canadian gold explorer and we are lucky enough to control an entire gold district. A lot, not a lot of companies can claim that. We already have a significant resource there, 100% owned, 60,000 hectare district scale, multi-million ounce potential district. That million ounce resource at 1.43 grams per ton is a very shallow resource. Most of it is less than 100 meters deep. There's almost no overburn to speak of. It is effectively open in almost uh, all directions. Today we'll talk a little bit about that. That's our Taurus deposit. In addition to that, five kilometers south of that Taurus deposit, we also have a high-grade vein system at Cassier South. These, these veins run on average two to three meters thick, 15 to 25 gram per ton. So very, very high grade and lots of room to, to expand those vein systems. They will also touch briefly upon that. Cassier Gold is also very lucky to be in a very safe jurisdiction. This is becoming more and more of a topic these days. A lot of more risky jurisdictions are getting challenged. So we're very lucky on that sense being in, in Northern British Columbia. We are also have the benefit of a lot of infrastructure. We, have a, we are a brownfield project, so it comes with a lot of benefits. We have a permanent camp. We have Highway 37 bisecting our property. You can actually drive from Vancouver to the top of that million ounce deposit without ever leaving a paved road. We have a fully owned and permitted 300 ton per day mill, which is extremely valuable. 
We have over 160 kilometers of property access roads that connect all of our infrastructure together. And we also have 25 kilometers of underground workings connecting the high-grade veins that I mentioned that we have at Cassier South to all of the infrastructure that we have at surface. We also have a, a world-class leadership team. We have a really amazing uh, set of people involved with this company, people like our chairman, Steve Lebwin, who spent uh, over 10 years at IM Gold, Steve, uh, Steve Robertson, a Schultz Award recipient with lots of experience in, in, in British Columbia, more notably at Red Chris, which is just 200 kilometers south of us, Doug Kerwin, David Reese, who's in, on the call, Chris Stewart, just to name a few. We also have very high insider ownership and very, very good institutional support. And I'll mention uh, maybe later some of those names there. We're quite committed to sustainability and we have an excellent relationship with our First Nation partners, which is great. Social license to operate is critical anywhere in the world, especially so in Canada and BC. And we are very, very lucky on that sense. And then, you know, very importantly, we are very, very attractively valued. 65 million market cap with a very healthy cash position. You know, for what we have, it's it's really quite attractive and we're very, very lucky to be where we are and we have, having the prospects that we have. Just very quickly to give you a bit of a lay of the land for those that don't know, our Cassier Gold project, our flagship project is located in Northern BC, close to the border with the Yukon there, just 80, 80 kilometers south of, of Silvertip and 200 kilometers north of the Red Chris, majority owned by, by Newcrest and GT Gold, which was acquired last year by, by Newmont so along that main highway that goes into the north and close to the other Golden Triangle projects as well. Then we also have a secondary asset called Sheep Creek located in Center BC, quite prospective, has produced nearly a million ounces at 13 grams per ton, quite similar to what we have at Castor South with the high-grade vein systems. Very, very exciting. It's the third most prolific inland origin ecosystem in BC with the second one being the Castor Gold Project and the first one, the Caribou Barkerville being developed by Osisco right now. Just to give you a bit of the lay of the land here, so we have a 100% owned 59,000 hectare uh, district scale origin Gold system here. Uh, roughly 30 kilometers by 25 kilometers. You can see in red, the Highway 37 coming from the south and bisecting our property. You have uh, the mill, uh, fully owned, 300 ton per day, the camp uh, next to it. Then we have a paved road that peels off Highway 37 that goes over our Taurus deposit there and going into the historic Cassiar open pit asbestos mine in, in town sites. That Highway 37 separates Cassiar North from Cassiar South. Cassiar North is for the most part both tonnage, open pitable, one to two gram near surface targets like our Taurus deposit. Uh, they will talk about Taurus and also some other uh, regional scale targets at Cassiar uh, North. And then Cassier South is where we have those high grade veins, 15 to 25 gram per ton, one, uh, two to three meter thick. You can also see in colors there our mine permits in orange and the Cassier South and in, in green and yellow on the Cassier North area. Just to give you one last visual, you can see here on this, on this picture, this is a picture taken from Lucky, which is prospect just two kilometers north of, of Taurus. Here we are looking south. The Highway 37 runs through more or less along that yellow dash line. And next to it, we have fully owned and permitted 300 ton per day mill, core facility and office, as well as the camp along the highway. Then that road that I mentioned that peels off Highway 37 goes over the Torres deposits into the old Cassier town sites. And then at the end, you, you can see the Cassier South high grade main targets uh, with the main mine portals just overlooking the mill in those alpine targets. At the end, at the close to the horizon, the QSEC and main mine portals, you can see how gentle the topography is, relatively easy to work with. And just to give you a sense of scale, there's a vertical difference between those alpine targets at Cassier South and the bottom of the valley of 600 meters. And from where we are at Lucky, there's about a thousand meter vertical difference with the bottom of the valley being roughly a thousand meters above sea level. And uh, that was just to give you the context. And now I'll hand it over to David Reese to discuss a little bit more about our project, some of our results and what's in store for 2022. Over to you, Dave. Thanks, Marco. So on this slide here, as Marco was showing, the topography here is just ideal for exploration compared to other parts of British Columbia. It's, it's really incredible access with the Cassia Road, the paved road right in the valley below and road access to pretty much all of the prospects here. So it's there's very little uh, need for helicopter use except for some of the outlying targets that will be drilled in the future. So very accessible. You can see the, uh, the tourist deposit here, which I'll talk uh, mainly about just down right in the valley bottom, very accessible location. It's exposed right at surface. And then the Taurus mill site, to, just to the uh, east of it, uh, on the left-hand side of the image, uh, that's the old, the old, there was a mill there historically. 
um, the, the current mill is in the center of the image there. But that uh, the former Taurus mine site essentially was a, like a bulk sample of the Taurus deposit. It produced about 35,000 ounces uh, back in the 80s into the early 90s. So we have proven uh, knowledge of the mineralization style in, in that area. So what I'll talk about mainly today is some of the results of the, the drilling around the Taurus uh, deposit area, because that's mainly what's being released so far. There's still a number of holes remaining from South Cassiar. But the Taurus deposit is a, a, a large bulk tonnage, orogenic gold style of mineralization. It has a current uh, resource, an inferred resource of uh, 21.8 million tons at 1.43 grams per ton, so just over a million ounces. And you can see in the, the map on the left, the yellow outline of the grade shells and the drill holes also in black on that diagram too. And really those shapes are reflecting the 1990s property boundaries of international tourist resources. So a lot of the historic drilling was done in those days. The resource was based initially in the first resources years ago on those drill holes and subsequent operators have, have tended to uh, mainly drill close to where there was previous uh, mineralization known. So the mineralization largely in that area is, is open. It's particularly to the south, there's some very broad intercepts that are open, which I'll talk about, which some of which were drilled this year. So the company has taken approach to looking at that resource in its initial drilling stages, including this year, of a combination of, of doing some infill drilling, because you can see the drill hole spacing there is very wide. And the cross section you see on the lower right illustrates this. You can see that's a, an east-west section to the deposit. You can see where resource outlines are. And there's a lot of gaps, and a lot of those gaps aren't related to gaps in mineralization. They're related to gaps in drilling, so very, very widely spaced drill holes. It's a big area. The, the deposits uh, or the, the zone there is up to a couple of kilometers wide in the main body there and over a one and a half kilometer north south strike length with mineralization, as I mentioned, over to the south. The mineralization you can see in the cross section on the right is, is in a low hill, it's outcropping right at surface. You could there's trenches right in it. There, it's just an ideal situation for open pit scenario. And some of the drilling we're going to talk about, you can see on the left of that cross section, there's a fault dipping to the right in yellow. That is the Taurus West Fault or Taurus Shear, and that uh, is an area where there's been a lot of. Uh, broad hits of mineralization of tens of meters resource greater or above you know, two to three grams. And so it's those types of areas in the deposit and also that are open that are particularly interesting for focus because if you can define uh, corridors and link them better inside the resource of higher Great than, than resource grade, plus infill uh, some of the gaps in the resource, there's, there's a great potential for expanding internally the resource. But also the exciting potential is in stepping out and really expanding that footprint of that deposit, which is really quite open. And you'll see on the map on the right, on the lower center, there's a little red area called Wings Canyon down in the bottom right that Marco's circling right there. That area has got a lot of outcropping veins. We'll talk about it later on. There's some drill intercepts in there that are, you know, tens to over 100 meters, plus 0 0.6, 0 0.7 grams, and, and higher grade intercepts of plus 10 grams in there. There's no evidence that and the main torus deposit are not continuous. Basically, there's no drilling in between. There's a lot of potential just to completely expand the footprint of this system. It, it's really quite remarkable. So you can see this is some of the mineralization style at Taurus. So what makes it up is essentially these sets of sheeted quartz veins you can see here throughout most of the deposit. You can see in the upper right, the marker showing sheeted sets of quartz extension veins that are quite steeply dipping with rusty rock in between. So this is a, you're oxidizing a surface. It's carbonate altered. So the, the carbonate actually has, has a, as a buffer against acid rock drainage. But it, the veins do have pyrite envelopes. You can see in the lower right, you can see all the coarse pyrite around the veins there. So the, the gold occurs in a combination of the disseminated pyrite and the wall rock. And also, and you can see in the upper left, visible gold within some of those veins. And so in the, the lower left image, the historical underground portal you see there, that was an exploration drive just in part of Taurus. You can see there that you have these corridors of more concentrated veins, often with shear zone along the middle, a small one in the middle, where you have these rusty areas of uh, carbonate alteration, disseminated pyrite, which form the higher grade corridor. So something like that could be anywhere from you know three to five grams per ton over that kind of a width there. And this is the sable area of the deposit where we have these corridors of shear veins coming through. 
So if we go to the next slide, we can see how this is distributed in some of the new drilling. So the drilling this year was defined to help better track out some of those corridors of higher grade mineralization in some of the broader drill gaps. You can see the scale on the bottom there. The, most of the drilling, particularly in the west part of the deposit, is at greater than 50 meter spacing. And it, when you start to view this in cross section with these drill holes, a lot of those drill holes are actually over 100 meters apart. These are very widely spaced holes. So it doesn't allow you to really pull mineralization continuously between the holes. And you see a lot of the gaps in the resource there reflect that. It's just widely spaced drilling. And so it means too that can only establish a certain interpolation distance around the drill hole. So you can't bring the grade between the drill holes. You can see that we had success in defining some of that continuity and also in stepping out and so you can see a, a few of the holes from about you know, 127 to about 135 there were, were in filling some of the gaps in the north. And then other holes, uh, 137, 138, 139, and 125 to 126 and 129 plus 128, we're all really drilling on the southern limits of the mineralization there. And so you can see there's some excellent intercepts in here, intercepts of you know 16.9 or sorry, at 23.2 meters at 3.56 grams per ton in hole 129, 13 meters at 3.53125, intercepts that are above cutoff grade and many above resource grade over uh, intervals of, of you know, plus 40 meters in a lot of different holes in through here. So plus uh, 1.5 to 2.5 grams per ton. So I think we had a good success in, in defining this and also illustrating that the mineralization is open. If you look at 130, hole 139, for example, on the southern uh, end there, that hole was drilled underneath a lot of historical holes. And many of the historical holes were quite shallowly drilled. So some of these holes are going deeper. The holes continue to hit mineralization in depth and mineralization is open to the south. And we're gonna look at some cross sections through these that demonstrate uh, some of uh, that uh, distribution. So here's some of the holes that were drilled um, in, uh, in the, uh, um, the 88 zone in the upper parts of the deposit. These were uh, drill holes drilling in largely between large gaps, like plus 100 meter gaps in uh, drill holes uh, in the resource to establish continuity. You can see the, the general pink outlines are the resource from 0.3 gram plus cutoff grade. So that's the part of the, the block model. And you can see these, these holes will establish greater continuity of, of reasonable grade between existing drill holes to so establish, in many cases, blocks that were, were open in between. And you can see these holes were drilled in this Taurus West fault, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, this is a big area. You can see some of these holes here, like the on the left, uh, hole 134 had 45 meters at 2.5 grams. So that was in a gap of over 100 meters. But the other thing that's really noticeable here is that look up dip to the left. There's no drilling up there. You know, these are big areas. If you can define areas that look at those scale, 100 meters on the left there, there's a several hundred meter uh, dip length there where you could place additional holes to look for a continuity of mineralization. Those kinds of grades and those widths of 45 meters, you can very, very quickly add a lot of tonnage to this deposit with, internal to the footprint of the uh, resort, historical resource and recent resource. So without even stepping out, you can actually do a lot of addition to this deposit. And similarly, on the right, you can see the same thing of right above the Taurus West Fault, we have these broad intercepts you know, above a resource grade, 45.6 meters at 1.8 grams per ton. So these are, these are very good grades. I mean, Detour Lake is often mining it, uh, for example, under a gram per ton in Ontario. And, and so these grades are really quite nice for mine open pit uh, scenarios. So these holes are a mixture of ones mainly uh, just on the southern margins of the deposit. You can see in particular the hole on the left, hole 128. So this hole drilled well below the previous drill holes. You can see the traces in, in the gray lines of some of the historical drill holes there. And it, it shows you that basically the mineralization is all completely open to the south here. You see the lower part of that intercept, uh, 45.3 meters at 1.29 grams per ton. It's illustrating you know, broad intervals down to 300 meters plus depth here, uh, right above the Taurus West Fault again. And so this is really, again, very big areas, very big blocks that we're defining here, which have the potential to uh, be uh, continuous all the way southward, totally open, no drilling to the south whatsoever uh, in these areas, certainly not to those depths. 
And on the right here, you can see again near the southern limits of the resource, you know, 34.92 meters at 2.956 rounds per ton. Again, below the depths of historical holes, that mineralization is all totally open to the south. So these are big, broad intercepts that are open, and this deposit could get very big very quickly at those kinds of grades. So it's all very positive here. And here's these some of these holes were drilled near the southern parts of the deposit as well. So some of these, uh, again, there's the Taurus West Fault. Actually, sorry, these are in the central part you know, along the Taurus West Fault, again, establishing continuity between the holes that were widely spaced. You can see the resource model doesn't go through some of these areas or it is uh, patchy, and it's patchy because you're at uh, large gaps between drill holes. So again, this will basically infill all that area and bring mineralization in between. So we're, we're, we're expanding the footprint of the resource base even internally within the deposit with these types of holes. And so, so that really uh, gives you a, a synopsis of some of the Taurus drilling. The plans there are really next year to be stepping out from Taurus, doing a few more infill holes. I mean, ultimately, this is an inferred resource at Taurus um, to needs to be brought to an indicated status in the future. And the focus would be on those higher grade and thicker corridors. There's a lot of other targets around here. But one of the big advantages of this whole district is that once you do bring these resources up, and we're going to talk about South Coast here briefly here too, is the infrastructure provides you a great scenario for future uh, mining moving forward because the areas in orange on the right there and the areas in yellow around Taurus and green are all mining permits. So the, the company already has mine permits over these areas. So it's well ahead of the game and all of this. There is an existing mill on site, which uh, produced uh, the source of most of the production from the South Cassie area, which we're just about to talk about, the main Volag and Cusack areas, where there's about 350,000 ounces produced at 15 to 25 grams per ton. So that mill was operational in the, from the late 80s and through the 90s and early 2000s, and was refurbished as recently as, uh, as 2010 by Hawthorne Gold, the predecessor to Cassie Gold here, who consolidated the district. So that mill had recoveries of over 93% and is still potentially operational for in the future easily if with some additional refurbishment with a permitted tailings pond. So it could be a potential for near-term production, particularly from the high grade base of the south. Obviously, if you had to find a very large resource at Taurus, you'd need a larger mill than that, but it provides you a site and location for that. And between the two areas, high grade veins to the south and low grade to the north, you also have potential for a, uh, a blended operation of low grade with high grade. So let's have a look at the, the southern areas now. So overall, this is a, a view of that illustrates some of the exploration potential on the project and illustrates why we're excited, particularly about some of the southern areas too. So this cross section is looking to the west. It shows the geology. And uh, it's uh, on the right is the lucky area where we saw that first photo looking down in the valley. And on the left uh, in the main mine area is the ridge that most of the historical uh, mining was from in the Cassiar South area, of which there was about 350,000 ounces produced. The production in these areas came from a flat lying um, volcanic stratigraphy. So it's a classic greenstone belt geology of mafic volcanic rocks in green that are interlayered with these gray areas of these fine grained sediments. And in purple, ultramafic rocks, which are, are carbonate altered and have shear zones along them. We call this Liswinite alteration. They have nice green carbonate, fuchsite or mariposite. Um, and those rock units, the sediments and the ultramafics essentially act as weak units, which when this whole rock mass was deformed in the Cretaceous, acted as shear zones. And those shear zones between them, you can see the top to the north displacement here. Between them, we have uh, vein systems that branch off. So the veins like to form in incompetent rocks, fractures open, the veins form in the, the nice uh, competent mafic volcanic rocks between the weak rocks. So it's the weak rocks that control where the veins are, but the veins form in the mafic volcanic rocks in between. Now the significance of this, because it's a layered stratigraphy, is that there's more than one rock unit that hosts these veins. You can see the blue is the historical known veins, we're known mining from, and they're from at least in the Cassiar South there, at least two mafic volcanic horizons. If you go in the valley, to the north, to the right, there's additional volcanic horizons that contain them. So there's no reason not to have potential for underneath the Cassiar South area stacking of additional veins. We have the evidence of that, and this really very being very little drill testing beyond the historical mine workings. And the same on the Taurus area to the right. You can see Taurus with its more broad zones of mineralization also 
uh, illustrates a stacked volcanic stratigraphy where we have veins all the way up to the ridge to Lucky as well. So this is the premises of a lot of the exploration is that the historical drilling has been very focused around known targets like Taurus or the mines to the south. And there's lots of room to grow and to find blind stack mineralization beneath some of these different flatline sedimentary units and ultramafic units for additional vein systems. And here is what some of these vein systems look like. You can see the uh, uh, some photos. So there's a lot of visible gold. In the lower left, you can see the, the coarse gold here. So this is why we had 300,000 ounces plus 350,000 ounces of 10 to 20 grams per ton, including mining dilutions. That's basically after mining production numbers. And so these are classic orogenic gold style things. They have tetrahedrite in them. We'd call this an epizonal style orogenic system as is the same as applied to things like newfound gold stuff in Newfoundland and Fosterville. So these are, these are high, sort of high level type orogenic gold systems. And they have just classic kind of nice steeply dipping veins with carbonate alteration. On the right, you can see some of that green fuchsitic alteration associated with the ultramafic units in the shear zones. So the controls on these vein systems are very clear and we have um, geological parameters to help target these. And you can see in the upper right, some of the, the patterns where we have changes in the morphology of the mafic units. They're often associated with the positions of the veins, with, this, with their veins are forming in shear zones. So tracking out these changes in the morphology and the alteration, we can target additional veins and each of these veins can potentially contain, you know, anywhere from tens of thousands of ounces up to, uh, you know, 75,000 ounces. If you add up a whole series of veins, you very quickly get, uh, can, can build up, if you can identify additional ones, some higher grade resources in the area. So that's the objective of the company to find additional veins like this here. Um, and there's lots of room to do that. And you can see here's a plan view uh, showing the main mine in the upper part in the north, Volog mine, Cusack, and East Bay. And these are the historic producers. You can see the tons and the grades produced from these. And there's lots of room in between. If you press the slide button, forward button again, you'll see this is the type of objective is to look for blind veins. That these are not outcropping, but these are veins that are in these stacked mafic horizons. You can see there's a periodicity to these veins based on the space of the hot, um, the Cusack and, and Bain veins there. So we want to look for that type of spacing. You can see on that map, the little black or gray dots are the drill holes and this very little drilling in a lot of areas outside of the historical mining. And some of the previous results the company reported this year as a case in point, there was, uh, the company did some drilling uh, around the Bain vein system to establish more continuity of the Bain vein uh, system here and, and some of the East Bain intercepts that were intercepted. You can see here on the right, the East uh, intercepted 4.8 meters at 35.1 grams per ton and uh, 6.4 meters at 12.6 grams per ton. So these are right in line with the historic production grades and widths. And so illustrate uh, that you know a lot of this mineralization is, is unmined. And uh, in fact, that those intercepts are 160 meters from historical underground workings. So again, you know, with the mill present, if you define some of these types of veins and, and several uh, of these, you have the potential for very quick near-term production in these areas. And this illustrates some of the targets. So since we were talking mainly about Taurus in this presentation, this illustrates some of the targets here in the northern part of the property that um, either are Taurus style or near Taurus. And uh, here's three that are illustrated that the company intends to drill and, and explore further this year. So all three of these targets have had very little or no drilling. So Wings Canyon, I mentioned, is just uh, southeast of Taurus itself. You get a huge quartz veins in this creek here, which you have plaster production from in the creek and big, big hydrothermal system with already so the, the few drill holes there include you know, these long intervals, 128 meters, for example, at 0.56 rounds per ton. And anyway, lots of room here and potential to link it up to Taurus and also totally open to the east. And to the east of that, you can see there's the Snow Creek prospect, which is several kilometers to the east. And itself, it's got uh, more than 1.4 1, 1 kilometers of the strike length of, of known veins in outcrop and prospects that are shedding plaster material into creeks below. There was a lot of historical plaster production in this area. And you can see on the on the right photo in Snow Creek, an image with a geologist. You, just, you can see just in the middle there, standing on an outcrop with all the sheeted veins extending upward and down in that image there and a big vein on the right hand side just in the middle of that there it is right there so this is looks just like taurus it has 
almost no drilling in it. Some just a few little shallow holes that were drilled in easy to get out areas. And so the company would be exploring this this coming year. And then the Lucky Prospect, which is way up on the ridge to the north. You can see that uh, in the image there, all those gossiness areas, those are sets. You can see all the quartz veins running through there, just vein after vein. Some of them are subcropping. There's some rubbly areas where there's a lot of uh, good grades and soil samples and till. And so there's a, a lot of room to grow in that area too. So there's a numerous prospects on this property and it's, uh, it's really quite an exciting area. And I think that's my portion of the presentation. So I'll just hand that back to Marco on that. Thank you, Dave. Uh, that, that was uh, really amazing. And I think we'll, we'll have some, some space for questions, but uh, just to give everyone a quick uh, snapshot of the company before we move on to, to Q&A, capital structure. So Castor Gold, we have 62 million shares outstanding and a half, you know, close to a dollar, dollar zero four, we're 65 million market cap, which, you know, given what we have is actually quite attractive, a healthy cash position. Uh, we have coverage from, from Red Cloud since, since last year. David Talbot wrote us up. And uh, we also have very high insider ownership, 28%. Institutional, uh, very good institutional support. You can see maybe some of the names will recognize them. You know, Sprott, uh, Crescat Capital, uh, EMA Larry Leppard out of the US, Commodity Discovery Fund out of Amsterdam, Terry Capital out of uh, Australia or EMC or MCM. Obviously, EMC, uh, very you know, great supporters also investors out of Hong Kong, you know, it's a real, really unique, unique position. And just to, to, to cap it up before we move on to Q and A, uh, as a company, we really have a significant resource there. And as they've basically mentioned, we have a lot of, a lot of exploration upside, lots of upside at Taurus, lots of upside in other uh, both tonnage targets like Wings Canyon, uh, Snow Creek, uh, Lucky, as well as the South Cassier vein systems uh, for which we still have uh, 13 holes uh, pending to release. So lots of room to grow. We're in a safe mining jurisdiction with a lot of existing infrastructure, as well as the permits. We're in a very unique position as a company because of this jurisdiction and all these infrastructure and permits and the fully owned mill that we have. We have a truly a world-class leadership team. I'm, I'm very proud and humbled to be, be surrounded by this, this caliber of people. And we're truly committed to sustainability. We have uh, excellent community partners. And again, we're very, very attractively valued. So I hope you, you feel the same. And, and maybe with this, we can move on to some Q&A. Well, thank you, Marco. Thank you very much for your presentation. We received some questions. So first of all, uh, your presentation says that drilling is planned at Sheep Creek. How much drilling do you plan to do there? When can we expect the drills to start drilling? Uh, I, I can maybe just highlight like an overview on that. Uh, so we're still uh, have results pending from uh, from this from the 2021 uh, drill program. So we're obviously, and this is a bit of a general answer. We're still working specifically how we're going to allocate the drill meters for the, for next year. It's also very important to receive all the drill data for before we we commit to a specific number. But obviously, what we want to have is is truly a healthy combination, a healthy balance between continue to grow Taurus, continue to step out laterally at Taurus, the finding higher grid corridors at Taurus, continue to grow the Cassier South Vein systems, which as we already demonstrated, can be extremely pro prolific. And then also start to advance some other regional scale targets like Lucky, uh, like Snow Creek, like Wings Canyon. And obviously, Sheep Creek is also quite an exciting target. His uh, high-grade uh, vein system has produced nearly a million ounces at over 13 grams per ton, very, very high-grade. It's in nature quite similar to what we have at Castor South, very high-grade discrete veins. And uh, what's also exciting about uh, Sheep Creek is drill in, uh, during the winter as well, which reduces our seasonality as well in terms of, of news flow. We don't have a specific number, but we're obviously going to be working out, and we certainly have a really exciting target. But... There's a lot of work that will still need to be done. Actually, tomorrow we'll have a technical session to discuss some of the drill results and a bit of the strategy for next year. So we're, um, we'll obviously come up with a more specific drill program and uh, with exact numbers, but I just wanted to give that context for the answer because there's still a lot of things that we're uh, going to be uh, assessed and discussed before we commit to a specific number. But maybe I'll uh, let David Rees, if you want to add anything to this. No, that's uh, that's good, Marco. I mean, uh, the Sheep Creek Camp is one of uh, BC's largest gold-producing districts, and it has a lot of similarities to uh, to Cassiar in its style, as well as Barkerville too. So <clears throat> there's there's very little work being done recently there, and 
and the company just really needs to do a good evaluation of that whole district, which is what's planned before uh, going in and doing a further exploration there. But I think the potential is very high. It's a, again, Sheep Creek was a high grade producer like South Cassiar. And so there's the potential for high grade uh, uh, individual veins, uh, the visible gold bearing veins, uh, just like you had in the South Cassiar area. So it's a promising district. Thank you. The next question is, how much of your budget goes into test some of these regional targets such as Green Canyon, Black Bay, or Snow Lake? I guess the question there is, again, Marco alluded to we're having a major technical session tomorrow, and, and part of what we're going to be discussing is how to allocate the relative amounts of budget between the different areas. Um, some of those targets, uh, as mentioned, Snow Creek and a few others there might require helicopter-based drilling, but most is all going to be uh, road-based. So we just have to figure out how to best uh, allocate the drilling between those areas and the, and the different ratios. We know that all of those targets will be drilled this year. It's just a question of what, what the allocation will be. It hasn't been set up yet. So there's obviously in some of these targets, there's reconnaissance drilling to do beforehand. So places like uh, you know, Snow Creek and Lucky, uh, which have very few holes or no holes in many areas, you'd be just drilling very widely spaced initial holes in prospective areas. So you might drill just a handful of holes in some of those areas because at this stage, you're learning about these, these prospects and what uh, the continuity and style of mineralization is in some of these areas. Places like Wings Canyon, on the other hand, has road access. I would say probably, you know, there's a lot of room there to grow, a lot of easy air access. You could probably drill some more holes right around that area because we know more about it and it is close to Taurus. So it'll depend um, what those, those prospects look like. And I haven't even talked about this, this dozens of other prospects on the property between Taurus and, uh, and South Cassiar that have had limited drilling. And um, I was looking at some of the data last night. There's some, you know, some open areas of mineralization around quite a few prospects uh, in those areas. So, you know, we'll have to just uh, prioritize those and, and go on that basis. But having the road access makes it very easy to get into and, and explore. Like New Coast, you see, for example, in between is Taurus style mineralization, which hasn't had drilling for years and some good intercepts in that one uh, there too. And Hunter and Teresa on the lower right, those are nice uh, South Cassiar style veins way to the east, you know, in an area that uh, has some cover from some of these sediments. There's lots of room underneath the, the, the sediments there in the Mafic Volcanics. Um, and Hunter and Trees have visible gold bearing veins at surface. It's, it's really uh, so quite a, quite a big area there. Thank you. The next question, how much drilling has been completed at Taurus since the last results transferred? When do you expect to put out the next Taurus resort? What about the resort for Cassia and Pouch? So uh, Taurus area, um, as you can see, um, a lot of the, the drilling since the last resource, last resource is 2019. There's not, there's not that many. I can't remember how many holes it was last year, but it's probably, what was it, uh, Marco? It was uh, about- We used last year 5,000 meters, 19 drill holes. 19. So it's about, it's, it's about over 30 holes. So in a, in a deposit that has a um, big footprint like that, 30 holes doesn't really make a lot of uh, difference in the sense of, of, of size yet. Um, so, you know, there's no point in really putting out a new resource for, for um, until you have a substantial increase in the previous one. Um, otherwise, you, you know, you're just capping something that is open. I mean, the mineralization is completely open here. So, um, and also too, part of the intent is to increase in Taurus status of some of that mineralization from inferred to indicated. So we'll be looking to at some of the higher grade corridors there. So until that's done, so I, I'd say the earliest that be looking at potential any resources is, is over a year from now after this next year's program. And it also to depend on the results of the program. If you're finding large areas that are still open where the mineralization can, can expand, of course, um, then the focus will be on expanding that and not uh, putting out a resource that will basically just be a temporary snapshot. So really we want to make some good advances in the in the uh, deposit first. We already the drilling that's occurred in the last two years will clearly expand that resource base. It's just uh, it's not going to expand it to you know plus 30 percent or anything like that at this stage. Um, so I think you'd be wanting to look again at larger increment before you start to put out new resource uh, numbers uh, otherwise it, it really doesn't mean anything so uh, for, for open mineralization. And the next question is, how much of a priority do you place on higher grade mineralization of South Cassia that might be able to stay near term production? 
Yeah, and I think there was a question too about the resources in South Cassiar, and there there are um, a historical resources in South Cassiar. It's, it's around seventy thousand ounces at about uh, fifteen or twenty grams per ton, and so the company could easily take those actually up to reserve status because you have a mill, right? You got, you got a mill right there by doing some PA and, and feasibility work very quickly. Um, but of course, that's not the objective just to have that small size. So that's the next step is to say, hey, look, we got this base already. We have underground workings very close to all to that existing um, area of mineralization and the historical resource. It needs to be, again, that's a historical one from about 10 years ago. So that needs to be updated by the company. But there is all the potential of these, these parallel veins. So one of the main objectives that next year will be to look for and uh, parallel veins, additional veins, and stacked veins to in the South Cassiar area. So a significant amount of the drilling will be for those targets that, that Marcos just brought up on the left uh, to look for these types of targets here. And one possible uh, scenario that the company's considered is the underground workings here are all in really good shape. The engineer go in and, and check out some of these workings. The Cusack and Bain areas, they're declines but they're not uh, having uh, huge amounts of water inflow they're um, actually they're not flooded to surface they're you can walk for example Bain about halfway down so so basically there is the potential for um, reopening these they're the oldest ones here in the 80s a lot in the 90s and into the early 2000s so these are modern underground workings in good ground conditions and if you reaccess those you have the potential for also drilling from the underground looking for parallel veins with shallow dipping drill holes you can look for save save a little bit of uh, distance from surface and also uh, be able to drill more efficiently that periodicity by drilling shallow dipping holes. So that's one consideration there is that we'll look at potentially for winter type programs, it would be ideal because you have that type of access. So there's lots of opportunities here. The company really just has to um, prioritize and, and uh, allocate uh, the proportions and that part of that the large meeting we're having tomorrow in the, in the coming weeks will be to do that. Okay, and the last question is Geologically, why is there bulk tonnage in the north and hybrid rains in the south? Craig, that's a good question. That's one I've wondered myself. And and it might relate to some of the nature of the mafic volcanics there or the position in the system. I mean, we know in the Cassiar South area, we have more of these ultra mafic units and they act as you know, nice through going shear zones. So that might help with the focus of the veins and through there versus at Taurus, it's more sediment units. So the shear zones are a little more distributed and it might relate to again, more distributed accommodation of some of that strain in between some of the units. And we don't know if the mafic volcanics look similar, but chemically they might be a little bit different between North and South Cassiar. I think they're more magnesium rich in the North. And so there, there may be some influence there, or maybe even there's potentially with the Taurus West fault. And also there's a second fault like it at the historical Taurus mine, which have are in graphitic shear zone. They're focusing on the sedimentary units and those structures have this more disseminated style of mineralization around them. So there may be also a, a contribution of even a little bit of an older style of mineralization in this area as well too. And you get the same kind of thing. If you look at the Wells Barkerville area, the the Bonanza ledge zone that is there is a disseminated pyritic style mineralization associated with graphitic shear zones. And then, then the main vein system in the Caribou Varkerville are in more uh, sandy, silty rock, more competent rock units as more high grade veins. So there may be some host rock control to that as well. Thank you, David. We actually just received another question. How large could the resources grow in the Cassia Gold District? Oh, they could grow significantly. You can see here that there's a lot of open mineralization, a lot of targets in this area. I think given that the exploration is really just around known areas, there's lots and lots of room here. Of course, I can't put a number. You can only put objectives on there, right? But certainly, I think you're just really scratching the surface in a lot of this stuff. Okay. And the question about the results, uh, when are the results expected for the remaining exports? I can answer that one. So we're, we have 13 holes left to, to release, uh, all of them coming from the Cassier South. So we've drilled 7,000 meters of Cassier South, 19 drill holes, we've released six. That include uh, those really two stellar intercepts, 4.8 meters at 35 grams per ton, 6.4 meters at 12.6 grams per ton. That's really exciting. You know, I've, I've been promising drill results and I've been wrong multiple times over the last few months. I think we'll have everything by the end of February, so over the next 30 days. So let's see, you know, the labs are still extremely delayed. Now things are get, starting to get better, but I think over the next few weeks, we'll have the next drill results from Cassier South. And we're really, really excited to be able to release those because... As you can see, they can be really, really significant. Also, we received a couple more questions. 
what's the expiration target for high grade? Well, as we talked about, there's quite a few expiration targets for high grade, but it, of course, the, from a geological sense, it's it's high grade orogenic gold veins that have, have a lot of free gold in them. And so that's the type of target. And of course, as target wise on the screen there, you know, the area of South Cassia, there's a lot of targets for that type. And that's what the historical production was all from. So to look at that periodicity, to look at the stacking, look at other prospects to in, in the district to the south and east and north, all around that area. So quite a few targets for that style of mineralization. Even uh, actually, it's interesting. Even if you if you go on Google Maps on the the Stuart Cassier Highway, just well west of this, just running on the very western limits of the property, you can even see exposures of these types of veins in road cuts. So there's there's lots of room for these vein systems to grow there all over the property. And one more question for you, David. Maybe you consult with the largest producers in the world. Why does Cassia intrigue you so much? Well, I think it's exciting because it's, a, well, first of all, it's a large district. I mean, it's, it's, it's a whole district. Um, it, uh, it has these different mineralization styles. The more styles you have often, the longer lived the mineralization you have in these areas is, um, and, uh, and the more potential for different target types. Um, it's, it's, I think it just has really a lot of a lot of potential here, and that's what's really always attracted me to it. It's just really intriguing. Everywhere you go on the property, there's 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 prospects, and even up in the ridge to the north, um, you know, there's the historic cast area specifying, which by the way is well off the property. It's not there's no liabilities associated with that. But to the east of that, if you go up to the old mine there, you can look onto the cast area property, and there's vein systems all up on those ridges to the north there. Uh, so all the way up to the highest, most ridges right down the valley bottom, you can see veins everywhere. So it's really quite an exciting property from that sense and um, uh, that, that there, there's just so much room to grow. And, and, uh, and from a BC sense, it's just so nice to have all that easy access to get through to, to all of it as well, too, rather than having to use a helicopter, go around and fight your way through uh, Devil's Club on 50 degree slopes in the Isket, <laughs> which I've done a lot of in the past. So it's really uh, quite an accessible area, it makes logistics. A lot easier to to do everything. Yes. So if you, you use the zero point seven cattle grade, what metal price assumption did you use to arrive at that? Can you talk about the potential to use the lower cattle? So the, the resource from uh, 2019 was actually a 0.3 cutoff grade. Some of the numbers there are listed for previous resources, the 0.5 cutoff grade shells there are from a previous resource. Um, but yeah, you can go to different cutoff grades. And, and so one of the objectives is, and we can use a lower cutoff grade, yes, but of course you'd need to demonstrate um, with you know, a fine grind and a proper milling process that you, you can do that. And uh, that's one of the, the things here is that if you read the 43101 report, some of the, the, the initial metallurgy implied a lower cutoff recoveries of some of this material, but there's nothing like arsenical pyrite, which often will have refractory gold in this deposit. And I think it's more of a grain size issue. So essentially you can go to your finer grinds and, and look at that potential. And again, that goes back to looking at Detour Lake. That's essentially what makes that uh, system so attractive is, is not only the, the total tonnage, the, the economy of scale, but also the, the fine grind that they're using really increases the recoveries dramatically in that deposit. And so, yes, there is the potential to go to lower cutoffs, but one of the objectives of the company is, is not to have to go to lower cutoffs, is to define the higher grade corridors plus resource grade internally within there to really define those higher grade areas. And so the objective would be really to elevate that 1.43 grams to a higher grade and still retain the same number of ounces or most of those ounces within that deposit. But again, lots and lots of room to grow outside. And you know, you'd be looking at, um, and I think one of the other questions which seems to have disappeared was about what, you know, what's the deposit size you're targeting here. And you're already at a million ounces. So with the footprint here, you know, you, you might want to put a target objective of you know two or three million ounces on this area and through here but with other targets like snow creek you know you have a lot of room to grow in that direction too again you can't put a number on how much you have here without knowing but certainly those are the types of objectives we want to be working towards here thank you david thank you michael Go. that's all the questions thank you again for taking your time thanks everyone for attending the webinar so stay tuned for the updates and congratulations with the exciting mission results Thank you, Adina. Thank you, David, for coming in. And also thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you for watching, everyone.